Thank you so much, CEO, and happy International Day of the Midwife to everyone out there. And uh, I appreciate you coming to my presentation. So my uh, presentation today is entitled Baby Proyecto, which in Haitian Creole means baby project. And it's about obstetrical and midwifery simulation training at FCO School of Nursing in Leogan in the Republic of Haiti. And I would like to thank my colleague, Brent Seibel, MD, who is uh, my colleague from the University of Florida in Jacksonville, who also assists me with this program there. So thinking about Haiti, um, as a child growing up in Scotland in the 1960s and 70s, um, and I'm sure all of you heard a lot about Haiti, and uh, I'm not sure whose microphone that is making the noise, but it's not mine. So Haiti in historical context, if you think about Haiti, it's a very interesting place and a very interesting republic. It was the first black republic in the world, and it was the first country in the Western Hemisphere to abolish slavery completely. And uh, on January 1, 1804, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, who was an African-born ex-slave, would declare Haiti independent. Unfortunately, since then, there's uh, been a lot of problems in Haiti, and of course, not, not least of which was the devastating earthquake in 2010. And one of the things that happened at that time in Haiti is, especially in Leogan and the surrounding where it was the epicenter of the earthquake, was many of the healthcare providers, including midwives, either died or were seriously injured. So the whole healthcare system basically at one fell swoop was wiped out. And at that time, Médecins Sans Frontières did a great job. They came in to help with emergency care. But up until now, there's been very piecemeal uh, work. So we're attempting to assist there with simulation training, which I'm going to talk about today. Well, where is Haiti and why should we care about it? So this is a little map here. So you can see Guantanamo, Guantanamo peeking in at the top left-hand corner there. And if you just looked further up on the map, you'll see um, the little part of Florida that sticks out there into the sea. So really not far away from where I live in Florida. And um, Haiti shares the island of Hispaniola with the Dominican Republic to its east. And for me to get to Haiti from Miami, just an hour and 20 minutes. So why should we care? Well, we know from studies that Haiti has devastating outcomes for women and babies. The maternal mortality rate last year was 359 per 100,000 live births. And if we compare that to where I live in the United States, this number is 14. So to think about that in perspective, you go an hour on the plane and you've got completely different outcomes for women and babies and families, in fact. So how did this study come about? And this is an ongoing, um, this is ongoing work that my team and I do in Haiti. So I was, in, I was invited to Leogan to do a needs assessment for another health centre in 2013. And uh, my colleague um, was there, and we were looking at traditional birth attendance and what were the options for women. And I actually had an appointment with the dean of the school there, Dean Hilda Alcindor. And um, she invited me to go and visit with her over at, it's called FCL, it's Faculty de Sciences Infirmières de l'Université Episcopale. And we call it FCL for short, so I'm going to be referring to FCL. So we had a very interesting conversation in 2013. And she requested um, that I think about coming over to teach midwifery and obstetric training classes uh, to bolster what was already being taught at FCO school. FCO is the only um, baccalaureate nursing program in um, Haiti. So it, it's got a very important uh, part to play in the healthcare system in Leogan and uh, all of Haiti, actually. We do know that obstetric and midwifery training is vital to empower nurses and midwife to be effective healthcare providers for women and newborns in Haiti. So 
what did we do? Well, I um, asked Hilda Alcindor what she would like, and she asked if we would consider bringing the team that I already had at the University of Florida, would I consider bringing that team over um, to teach at FCL? And I thought, well, why not? I think this is a great opportunity um, for um, some learning. And, um, you know, we could bring our, bring our equipment there and work. So we began there three years ago. And at first, we had 45 junior and senior nursing students who were identified by the faculty to attend the training. And we had a pre-selected sample of 41 were female, four were male. And they were all full-time enrolled BSN students at FCO. And here you can see us. Um, we're in our um, suturing lab, actually. So we bring all the equipment with us um, so that it, it's fully self-contained. So what did we do? We used a qualitative method to see how the students were learning. We used direct observation and evaluation. You're probably all familiar with Mama Natalie. It's a Lairdall device that's wearable. We do have, we've purchased two of them with our grant that I'll talk about at the end. We take those with us, and actually they live there now. Our Mama and Natalie's actually live in Leogan, and then we bring the rest of the equipment with us. These were, de these were devised for low resource environments. And it's interesting, actually, we use the same devices when we're working in <coughs> simulation labs in the USA. So that's what we did. That was the design of our um, program that we have there. So what did we do? And it's very interesting. We actually do a simulation lab Monday to Friday from 8 to 5. And we have a lot of different experiences. So we hold daily labs for between 9 and 12 students because we know that's about the most effective um, number. And we have US trained faculty. There's six of us that go. There's four midwives, one Haitian American RN and one physician. And here you can see Brent. He's demonstrating blood loss uh, to the students there. The learning scenarios include normal births, postpartum hemorrhage, which we know is a big problem in Haiti. We also talk about uh, infections because those are the two uh, highest risk things in Haiti are hemorrhage and infection. And we do suturing of simple lacerations because these students, they are. These ones we're talking about just now are nurses, and they will um, be expected to repair simple lacerations. And we do review normal anatomy and physiology of pregnancy and birth. So we give them objectives to complete prior to beginning the workshop. And these are um, written in um, Haitian Creole and French, because even though this school actually teaches in English, most of the students are more comfortable, obviously, in Haitian Creole and in French. So we do have it translated so that we can all uh, understand what we're all talking about. All the students rated the program um, as good or excellent, and they felt that the training was very useful, and they would be able to apply their new knowledge, because these students actually fan out in that area and work in the local health centers and in the local hospitals there in Leogan. They did not make any specific improvements in the course. And um, the students continued to reinforce their training with the use of the simulator devices and the equipment which was donated to the school. We do communicate regularly with the faculty. And um, we have a lot of ongoing meetings there to provide um, support. And then we also provide annual in-country trainings and online support as, as well there. And thank you, Céline. Um, that would be very helpful. And you can email me. I'll give you my email after. She's saying she could go there. She speaks French. And that would be very helpful. So the students felt really validated and empowered. I think one of the things is when we go to Haiti, we're not there. People ask me, they say, how many births did you do in Haiti? That is not our role. We are not going there to take over. Our role there is to educate so that this can be a self-sustaining program run by the faculty and staff there, and we will provide annual training um, so that the faculty there can take over this um, training program. And the students were able to learn and document their new skills. 
It is obviously difficult to assess the impact in the local community, but we do know that the students are very involved. And most of them want to stay in Haiti and in Leogan to work as nurses. They do not wish to leave Haiti. They actually want to stay and help in their own country. There are further simulation experiences planned at FCO, and we're also going to expand the offerings to include um, other local midwives and traditional birth attendants. So I always think of midwifery as serendipity. It was serendipity that I went to Haiti in 2013 with my colleague, and it was serendipity that made me meet with Dean Alessine Dorr. And interestingly enough, and I'm very excited to announce that Frontier Nursing University um, is developing an initiative with um, FCO School, and we've been tasked with assisting them, and it's going to be their program, so FCO will have a midwifery program, and it's going to be starting this year, so that's, I'm very excited to announce that uh, at uh, International Day of the Midwife. We're working very hard on um, the curriculum, and we're going to be enrolling our first um, midwifery students, who are all going to be uh, graduates of the nursing program at FCO, they'll be enrolled in fall this year. So it's extremely exciting for us. We're going to keep um, offering the um, annual training for the students because there's really strong demand. And now we're actually seeing the students again. We've seen them one year, and then we do a higher level course for them the next year. So it's very nice. We actually have students there more than one year. We've got to know them. So they're really coming on, and their skills are really excellent. We did add our Haitian American nurse, and that was really a big plus for us. Um, we're not very strong in French or Creole, but we do have um, translators there with us from the faculty. But bringing our colleague um, um, Esther Lean was a big plus for us because it really helped um, the students uh, learn more effectively, and it was very engaging for them. So. We, we really enjoyed that. I would like to thank um, the American College of Nurse Midwives Foundation. The Jeannie Raisler Award really helped this program get off the ground. And I really have great support from Frontier Nursing University and the University of Florida for making this um, educational initiative an ongoing project. And you can see here, um, all the students are very excited to receive their diplomas. And uh, we had another successful um, simulation project. So here's my um, contact information. I'd love to hear from any of you that are interested in this um, in this program, and I'd love to take some questions. We have good time for questions, and uh, Jane, I have a question to begin with. The program that Frontier Nursing University will be offering to the nurses once they graduate. Is that a certificate program? Is it Frontier's usual program? Or are you specially crafting uh, a program to meet the needs of the nurses? That is a fantastic question, and thank you for bringing that up. So at the present time, it's my understanding that it will be a graduate level certificate, which will follow the ICM competencies for midwifery. So we've basically gone to the ICM, which for all of you that are interested in international work, the ICM actually has basically your work done for you. They actually have a curriculum printed already that you can actually adapt for any situation. So we're using those competencies and we'll be adapting them um, for the program there. So at the moment, we're thinking it's going to be approximately a two-year program for the midwifery students. And for them, the days that work best are Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, because all of these are working people. So they'll have classes Friday, Saturday, and Sunday taught on the ground. Um, and we will have input online. So we'll have an online connection there. We will supply um, all the support and the, um, the uh, teaching materials. And that will be taught in English, but it will be translated, because we have a lot of um, support from our Francophone colleagues. So they will be assisting us with that. 
but um, it's a lot of work, but it's a really exciting avenue for us to um, pursue. And um, Jess Bentley asked, when, you're going, when you go there, how long do you stay? Well, it's such a beautiful country, um, but we do, because we all work, and it's, it's interesting because we take exactly the same process as what I teach in Florida. So we actually just go there for one week a year, but we do keep in touch with them um, frequently um, on email and on Skype. Is there a direct entry program, Celine says? That's, yes, um, there's training, and I don't want to speak to this because I'm sure midwives for Haiti would speak to this. Um, so uh, there, is, there is training from, by midwives for Haiti, but that would be something that they would address there. And you, um, Linda was going to ask about online teaching. So we are going to have online teaching, but we are going to actually have, um, you know, it would be like brick and mortar school. Now there will be like um, textbooks and um, you know papers and things like that because sometimes the the power can be a little um, temperamental so we don't get we don't get power all the time. And then um, Jess, thank you. No, I had to. I had another um, commitment. My colleagues already went to. Um, we actually have three students from Frontier who live in. Haiti and work there, and they will be planning to assist us as faculty. So sorry, I did not attend the women's conference because I actually had a previous engagement, but the president of our university, Sue Stone, was there along with um, some of our midwifery students who live in Haiti. Um, Gloria, and hello, Gloria. It's nice to see you from last year. I was Gloria's facilitator last year. We are looking to partner with other institutions. Um, that would be great. I'd love to hear from you. And um, so that's Hiromi in Japan asks about perineal suturing, and that is a great question. Thank you for bringing it up. Yes, it's a problem because unfortunately um, we have a lot of um, we have a lot of uh, learning we have to do in Haiti. Women are still having routine uh, episiotomies there, so yes, it is a problem because we're having um, a lot of uh, perineal trauma still, so it's a lot about education um, for midwives and providers there. Um, so this course doesn't mean this course is offered to registered nurses. The course that we offer basically is just to bolster their education that they're already having, um, just to, to improve um, their knowledge and skills. It's not uh, to provide um, a midwifery training per se. But the midwifery program obviously will be um, providing that. Uh, is there not perineal problems in all cultures to some extent? Yes, Linda, and probably for all of you, as Seal pointed out, um, I'm originally from Scotland, and I'm of the age where we still did. We had to do a certain amount of episiotomies in our training, so um, obviously. I only do about three episiotomies a year now. It's very rarely that I'll do them. So um, we do need to spread the word on perineal integrity and the importance of it. But the students also, the reason we do teach about um, suturing is that they are asked to do simple suturing as well. Because you know, if there's an accident or whatever, they'll be in the they'll be in the setting in the hospital where they might have to do simple suturing, so they can do hand ties and they can do um, instrument ties and they can identify the anatomy. So that's why we include suturing. Cecilia asks, how many midwives is Frontier hoping to educate annually when they're up and running? So we're hoping in the first class <coughs> about 15. So And they're former students uh, from the school, so there'll be about um, 15 in the first class. And then We'll probably uh, admit biannually, so that means every two years we'll have about 15. And we do have, we are working with different partners to find um, suitable clinical sites for that. Um, sorry, I'm going to cough. <coughs> That's a great question, Celine, and I don't like to answer that question. Celine asks, will midwives be autonomous? I think the, it depends where they work. 
and I'd like to have, I think Jess obviously works in Haiti. It depends where you work in Haiti, how much autonomy you have. I do believe in the hospitals it's difficult because um, a lot of the, uh, well, there are not a lot of physicians there, but birth tends to be um, the actual birth, not the physical care of women in labour, but the actual birth may be taken over by the physician. But we do know most healthcare in Haiti is provided in rural areas. So that means that the traditional birth attendants and local midwives um, are doing most of the care themselves. So that's why it's important to reach out and make sure there's um, excellent uh, training for these um, people in that area. So we are looking into that training as well. But we do know that Midwives for Haiti provides excellent training as well. Yes, so Jess is agreeing that it really depends on where you are um, in the country. So um, yeah, there's autonomy if you're in the rural area. But otherwise, um, if you're in a hospital, I think it's quite controlled and there's still um, it's, there's still, it's, it's, it's quite sad, there's still a lot of um, improvements to be made. Leo Gan used to have the best hospital in Haiti, um, the Hôpital Saint Croix, so um, the Red Cross Hospital, it was supposed to be one of the best and um, it's, it's quite difficult now, it's very under-resourced and um, they're having a lot of issues, so it's still very unstable, so we have to deal with a lot of and political issues as well as other issues when we go there. Yes, the healthcare system is broken, so we're trying to we're trying to make a difference as midwives and physicians, and uh, we're going to do our best on that. So, thank you for all your questions. I think Hiromi is asking another question here. She says, in our birth centre, we do not perform episiotomy and we do not suture even with a tear. We rarely have problems. It heals very well spontaneously. And Japanese midwives are not allowed to suture legally. So good work, Hiromi. Um, I do recall in Scotland in my training, um, and this was uh, 25 years ago, uh, that we were allowed to cut episiotomies, but we weren't allowed to suture. Um, so I had to learn my suturing when I went abroad. So I did not learn to suture until I left Scotland. I believe now that midwives in Scotland learn suturing. Jane, while other people are typing, is there a midwives association in Haiti that is providing some social support and that might work toward more favorable regulation? Well, that's a great question, Cecilia, and thank you for asking. Um, there, is, um, there is the Haitian um, Midwives Association, but they're based, I believe they're actually based in Miami. We have a big diaspora in Miami and in Florida in general. There's a huge diaspora that provides support to Haiti. Speaking uh, about midwifery in Haiti, um, I do know that there's, there is licensed midwives um, in Jack Mel and all around, which are American trained licensed midwives. And there's midwives for Haiti. But again, it's very um, piecemeal. So there isn't, as far as I'm aware, and Jess can probably speak to this as well, I'm not sure that there's, <clears throat> I'm not sure there's a national coalition of interested people. There was just the there was just a tour on uh, of women's health provision um, last month which my president of my university attended, Sue Stone, who's also a midwife, um, to see what um, was available for women in regards to women's health and midwifery care. But I don't believe that there's a national coalition at this time. So um, so uh, Jess is saying, and in Port-au-Prince, yeah, there is midwifery training in Port-au-Prince, but it's, there's no kind of national, national coalition that I'm aware of. So it's quite difficult because we're all kind of doing things here and things there. So we're trying to advertise this, you know, this program that we're going to be offering, and then 
going annually um, to empower the, the, the students that are there, even if these folks are not um, not midwives at the moment, they're midwives in the making. So they're very, very interested in women's care because we do know that, you know, if we have strong women and strong educated women and men that will have much greater improvement in health outcomes very quickly if we can empower them as quickly as possible. So thank you. We are well ahead of schedule. If there are other questions for Jane, please don't hesitate to ask. I see a couple of people are typing. In the so Jess asks, have I worked with Midwives for Haiti? Um, not in the formal sense, the informal sense that I have a lot of links with the folks that work there, but um, I have not. One of our students is actually going to be doing her clinical practicum partly in um, Port-au-Prince in Haiti, so um, with uh, midwives that are working for Midwives for Haiti. So the, this um, organization is an American organization that provides midwifery care and training um, in, in um, many areas in Haiti. So. Um, I do have informal links with them, but not in specifics. To our attendees, you aren't tied. A question about the perineal. Oh yeah, you aren't tied to typing into the chat box. We can open the microphone for you if you raise your hand. The little icon at the top of the screen. Sorry, go ahead. Ah. Yeah, so I was I was wanting to ask Hiromi about um her um how she Jane is such an Adobe pro she read her questions before I got to read them back to her she can read the chat box and her screen at the same time yeah I, I use them this kind of format for my students and no one likes to use the microphone so I always was used to them typing in the chat box Yeah, well, I've been doing this for a while, so, and I'm interested to hear from Celine. I'll uh, look forward to your email, Celine. But it's very, it's very fascinating working there. Um, in Leogan, it's so hot. There's no air conditioning, and the students are there. The women wear. Um, skirts and hose and, and uh, dress shoes and the men are wearing long pants and dress shoes and socks and it gets very hot in there and uh, no one ever asks to take a break. We're always working. We work right through so um, it, it's quite inspiring. Is this only for nurses in Haiti? Which are you talking about this, the training program? I guess you're talking about the training program Olivia. Yes, because it's for the school. It's based in the school. I mean, we've had folks, we had actually some students from Boston College that stopped by and um, they came and joined in. If there's people there, they can certainly come and join in. But this is particularly uh, to provide, um, provide uh, support for FCO and the training and the education that goes on there. 
And currently the, the midwifery program will only be open to um, nurses um, Jane. that are trained at FCO until it gets bigger because it's quite an undertaking for our school to take this on. So um, it's a lot of work and I'm sure in the future it will be very successful and will expand it. But it's very exciting. Um, so. Jane, you might tell our listeners a little bit about Frontier. So, so they can imagine how, how Frontier might take on a program in another country the way you're doing. The perineum, but it heals well. Of course, we transfer third degree tears to the doctors. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry, Seal, go ahead. Okay, so for those of you that are not um, American nurse midwives, our school was started um, in the 1920s by um, a woman called Mary Breckenridge, and she helped with the reconstruction of France after the war. She was an American trained RN nurse, and when she went to France, she discovered people called midwives. And when she was there, she thought, well, that's interesting, that's a really um, empowering profession. So after the war, she went to London and she saw women in London that were nurses and midwives at the same time and she thought this was a great model that could come um, to America. So she was the first American woman that became a midwife uh, in London. She did her training in London and then she actually went up to Scotland to do part of an, like an internship to learn about midwifery care in rural communities. So she brought British uh, nurse midwives over to Eastern Kentucky and uh, at that time the women in Eastern rural Kentucky were very poor and had very poor obstetrical outcomes and with her midwives and nurses they looked after the whole family and they took care of all these women and they actually had some of the best outcomes um, in the whole of America at that time. So the Frontier Nursing Service developed into Frontier Nursing University, which is now an online university and we have um, students all over the world, basically, um, mostly obviously in the contiguous United States, but we also have in Asia, we have in Guam, in Japan, Saipan, and also in Europe, in Germany um, and the UK, we also have um, students there. So we've been doing online um, for a long time, we have a lot of experience in delivering and remote uh, education and it's if you have an internet connection basically you can um, be at Frontier as a midwife um, because we can provide your training uh, with local, you have midwives in your local community providing your clinical care and we also have family nurse practitioner and we're about to start mental health um, practitioner training as well so it's very exciting. I actually was just in Guam a couple of months ago, um, so we had a very good time there. So I should have waved to Hiromi because um, I see she's in Japan. I did get to stop in Japan for a little time, so um, I'm glad Shari's here. Shout out to Shari, so proud to be a Frontier midwife, great. And um, Celine says, oh, we're talking about the sutures again. Um, yes, they, we, were, we have distinct tears that were sutured and the ones without suture. And Hiromi says, do you have entrance exam? What is the standard of the student's basic competencies? I think, Hiromi, that's a question. Why don't you email me? Um, because that's a question that would be best answered in, um, in an email. So I can speak to that uh, very well because that's part of my job. Thank you. Arigato. So um, I will... Um, I will look forward to hearing from you, and I'll look forward to talking with Celine as well about. I'm looking at your comment, Linda, about a yeah, perineal suturing would be a great workshop, and um, I would very much like ahead, to have Jane. my colleague Brent Seibel come. Um, he's the one of the top um, teaching obstetricians in Florida, and he's fantastic. So Crystal says it is our practice. Oh, sorry. It is our practice to not stitch first degree tears and leave second degrees uh, up to moms, but great majority choose to stay home without sutures. 
there is the thought, absolutely, Crystal's mentioning poor follow-up nutrition and infection control in Haiti, and that you've got that exactly right. Um, nutritional, nutritionally, um, a lot of these um, patients can be very deficient, so they're not going to heal normally, like somebody that's well nourished, say in America or the UK or in Canada or whatever, they're not going to heal as well. But yeah, I mean, I think most of us now realise that first degree tears can be left alone, and second degrees, um, perhaps maybe one stitch or whatever, just to take care of um, human. Linda's thinking about a perineal suturing workshop for next year, and I'm just trying to get my head around how we would do that online. We're straying far from Jane's topic on um, Haiti, but leaning on her expertise. Sorry, I lost my um, we have about five minutes left. Oh, um, I was just saying we've we've strayed far from your initial topic on Haiti. Um, we have about five minutes left. Any other questions for Jane? Hello, can you all hear me? We can hear you again, Jane. All right, sorry, um, my internet I got kicked off for a minute. Um, so, yeah, I think it sounds like we should definitely provide um, some uh, suturing workshops next next year. That's a great idea. So, um, and uh, Michaela said, telling us that there was information about the midwifery conference from Haiti in March 2013, and there was just a conference um, like last month as well. So. Oh, thank you. So it's 2016. So um, I will look that up as well. Thank you all. All and right. I, look to coming back this I am this going to. And thanks, you all, for facilitating. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. This was actually my first time facilitating. So you were my practice, Jane. Thank goodness it was you. Um, for all of our listeners, Jane and I go back a long time. Um, Delia, Jane Delia gave us and, wonderful uh, information about... I'm not sure if Seal's having issues, um, Chris, but uh, uh, we're not hearing Seal, so I don't know if she's speaking, but I was wondering if... Um, I'll see if I can turn off the record. Oh, I am speaking. Uh, I can't remember how to do that. I am speaking, I, and now I you can't hear me. Oh, okay. I can hear you, Sue. <laughs> We're all offering to do it now. I will turn it off. I can hear you, 